In tonight's Top Gear, a unique motorcycle, offering exhilaration and comfort. Does four-wheel steering give better car control? And a new way to learn how to handle a skid. Coming to you this week from the National Motorcycle Museum, just across the M42 from the NEC in Birmingham. Inside, there's an amazing collection of over 500 bikes that span, really, the entire history of the industry in this country. But this is undoubtedly one of the most remarkable. It's called the Quasar, now 10 years old, but it still points the way towards, well, a different and perhaps safer form of motorcycling. And we'll be seeing more of this and others like it later on. Indeed, safety is a major theme. Well, the motorcyclist's response to the Road Research Laboratory work has been very swift, very vocal and very negative. In fact, 100,000 of them have signed a petition calling for the resignation of Junior Minister Peter Bottomley, partly because they remain unconvinced the devices will work, but mainly because they resist very strongly the idea they should be compulsory. So the debate has just begun. Now, there is another approach to motorcycle safety, one that calls for a quite different kind of bike, and one that remains abandoning this traditional... Uh, horse riding position. Paul Blezard has joined the team to look into the world of feet first. Modern motorcycles are better in most ways than their predecessors. They have more power, better brakes and much better tyres and suspension. But big bikes are expensive to run. They can use as much petrol as a medium sized car because they're not very aerodynamic. On a sports machine like this very fast Yamaha FZR 1000, Crouching down gives reasonable wind cheating, but it's nowhere near as comfortable as riding the new Honda Gold Wing, the ultimate in touring comfort. But there is another kind of motorcycle which avoids the traditional choices. It's aerodynamic and comfortable at the same time, and maybe safer too. It's called a feet first bike, or FF for short, but only the name's new. The idea of a machine which combines the comfort of a car with the exhilaration and agility of a motorbike has been around for a long time. The traditional head-first riding position came from the need to pedal on the earliest motorised bicycles, like this 1905 Indian. Once pedals were no longer necessary, some people realised that it was possible to have a really comfortable seat and a lower centre of gravity, like on this superb water-cooled 1000cc 1912 Wilkinson. Then in the 1920s, the very popular Nera car combined a very low centre of gravity with an advanced steering system, which separated the suspension from the steering and gave it a legendary stability. Then in 1926, Sir Elliot Verdon Rowe built this monocar, which had not only a very advanced chassis with single-sided wheels at both ends, very low centre gravity and a very low seat, but also this bodywork to protect the rider from the worst of wind and weather. And he regularly used to ride it from Southampton to Manchester and back with just normal outdoor clothing. In the early 50s, NSU showed that a recumbent feet-first position was the secret to going really fast, shattering world speed records with their flying hammocks. Racers got the message about streamlining, but they kept the traditional head-first riding position. This unique Norton Kneeler, now in the Sammy Miller Museum, represents the most extreme head-first design. But some of these so-called dustbin fairings were highly susceptible to side wind, and in 1957 full streamlining was banned from racing, as it still is today. There was no real change in chassis design until 20 years later, when the extraordinary Quasar appeared. What was it designed to achieve? A better performance from less power by decreasing the actual aerodynamic drag of the conventional bike by making a smoother and a smaller shape to pass through the air. And on top of this, we really wanted to be able to travel through more of our winter season, you know, August, <laughs> September and so forth. And for this, we needed better protection for the rider. The windscreen and roof kept the wind and rain out, and the rather heavy but robust construction has proved very protective in accidents. The Quasar looks futuristic, but it uses a bicycle-inspired steering head in which the suspension is still turning with the front wheel. But there have been FS built with a steering system more like the Nera cars, in which the steering is separated from the suspension. 
like this FF that Pete Lawrence is building, which uses Jack DeFazio's centre hub steering system. You can see when the wheel turns, suspension stays still and it only moves up and down in a vertical plane. This is the latest Feet First bike, although you can see its similarity to the Avro Monocar of 60 years ago. It's got the advanced DeFazio steering, and it also has handlebars which steer more like a car steering wheel. Under here it's got a Reliant 850 engine and I'm sitting in a Volvo car seat. The Voyager was designed and built by Royce Creasy, the man who coined the term feet first. He claims the concept improves comfort, handling and safety. Comfort because of the better riding position and wind protection. Handling because of the low centre of gravity and sophisticated steering. But why safety? Well, first of all, it's more agile, so it's easier to avoid accidents. But secondly, you stay with the vehicle in an accident and, and are protected by it. And when might we be able to buy a machine like that? I hope within a year. And what sort of price are we talking about? Well, we're working on less than £6,000. British industry can't offer an FF for sale at the moment, but British ingenuity has resulted in enthusiasts all over the country building their own. They may look a bit homemade, but in my experience, they can offer a more practical and economical form of transport than most new machines currently available. Is this the ultimate feet-first motorcycle? It's called an Urkemobile, or Ecology Mobile in English, and it offers the best of motorcycle excitement with motor car comfort, although it looks more like a wingless glider. It's a lot different from the British FS, which is not surprising since it's the creation of a Swiss aeronautical engineer, Arnold Wagner. As most uh, people, I uh, travel mostly alone, and uh, it seemed unreasonable to carry 1,200 kilos of uh, tin and three or four empty seats just for myself in a briefcase. And on the other hand, you have this wonderful machine, the motorcycle, which is not uh, useful in our climate because you have to dress up like uh, astronaut. So, uh, the basic idea of this machine is the combination of the agility of the driving fun and of the low operating costs of the motorcycle combined with the practical usefulness of a car, which needed the enclosed uh, cabin. The result is a motorcycle twice the length and weight of many conventional machines, although it's no heavier than the new Honda Goldwing and has much better aerodynamics. A modest 90 horsepower can push it along at over 160 miles an hour. Low speed driving around town is more tricky because it's so long and wide, but filtering through traffic is illegal in its home territory anyway. Also, the enclosed body means it needs outrigger wheels to keep it upright at low speeds. Once they've been lowered, they have the effect of making the Urkemobile handle rather like a motorcycle and sidecar. Well, the easiest way to understand this extraordinary machine is to start with the basics. Here we have a standard BMW K100 RS, which uses the same telescopic forks and wheel, the same indicator mirror pods, the same instruments, the same handlebar controls, the same engine and transmission and rear wheel and exhaust. The only difference is that between the front forks and the engine, there's about four and a half feet of extra space for the rider and passenger. Well, holding it all together is this all-enveloping bodywork of Kevlar and fiberglass, which provides all the strength you need. There's no frame as such. You can see there's a car-type cabin with seats, inertia reel seat belts, plenty of space behind the passenger for lots of luggage for two people. Below that space, there's the engine, all enclosed by the bodywork. And, of course, your legs are enclosed as well, so you can't put your feet down, hence the need for the outrigger wheels. But what's it like to ride? In some ways, it's very like a car. No need for a crash helmet or any protective clothing, just a seat belt, heater and air conditioning instead. In place of the BMW first gear, there's a reverse fitted in the K100 gearbox, essential with a bike weighing nearly 900 pounds. Then there's the foot clutch and hand gear change to master, not to mention the outrigger wheels which are operated by a switch on the left handlebar. Watch the green light. There we go. Wheels are up. 
Once you've got the wheels up, it handles much like any other feet-first two-wheeler. Acceleration is not as lively as a K100s because of the extra weight, but fuel consumption benefits enormously from the good aerodynamics. It has a drag factor of less than 0.2 compared to around 0.3 for the best cars and 0.4 for a racing motorcycle. The Urkemobile is said to give over 90 miles to the gallon at 75 miles an hour, and it still does 0 to 60 in under 7 seconds. Inside it's very quiet, helping Arnold to enjoy opera on the sophisticated stereo system. It forms an appropriate accompaniment while he's blasting round the bends at impressive angles of lean. At the Nürburgring, he's been to 53 degrees from vertical and grounded the outriggers. In fact, the low centre of gravity makes leaning it over very easy, and the lack of lateral g-forces means that, unlike a car, you don't get thrown about when cornering. It is heavy steering. It does move about a bit, but it's important just to let it go. It's kind of self-steering self to a large extent. So once you're, you feel relaxed and confident with it, then you don't actually have to have a heavy grip on the bars at all. Although I've got blisters on my right hand from learning to drive it. So far, only four Urkemobiles have been built, but 20 more are scheduled for this year, selling at about £25,000 each. Hand-built construction is always costly. Arnold Wagner likens them to Bugattis, but says that a mass-produced Volkswagen version could be built for a fifth the price provided there was the necessary demand. That may seem unlikely now, but Switzerland already has draconian exhaust emission controls to preserve the environment. If governments ever took serious measures to conserve fuel and space, the ecology mobile might prove to be the shape of things to come. Now the nearest style into the Urkemobile in the museum here is this record-breaking triumph from the 50s. And it was really the exploits of this bike at Bonneville Flats in the States that led to the long and distinguished line of Triumph Bonneville road bikes. This was built in 81. The last of the line was built just last month. And that decline really is symptomatic of the malaise that affects the entire industry, with sales down by 70% during this decade. Is it too much to hope, perhaps, that the now struggling feet-first designers could be the start of a whole new British bike industry?